All right, guys, welcome to another episode of Anchor's Points. I'm Anchor Pete, and boy, am I super excited today because today I have Alex Cormack, who is a comic book artist, and I have Rich Duick, who is a comic book writer. And you guys are definitely the biggest names I've had on my show thus far. I've had a couple of comic book uh, writers, but never anyone that's worked for like IDW and has put out as much titles as you guys have. So thank you so much for being on the show. My pleasure. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Yeah. So, um, you know, I have just kind of gone through your books, you know, on comicsology, and I just had a bunch of questions. I, I read, of course, Road of Bones, which I thought was excellent, and we could talk about that in a little bit. But um, I was kind of curious about some of the books you've worked on before. Like, Alex, you worked on uh, Weed Magic and yep. um, Sync and uh, Future Proof and Oxymoron, right? Yeah. Now, I noticed that, like, Oxymoron and um, Sync are by Comics Tribe. Right. So, so can, can you guys tell me about Comics Tribe? Like, what's up with that company? Uh, one of the guys that runs it, uh, uh, Tyler James, uh, he's, uh, you know, we met because he didn't live too far from me, and we just kind of got to know each other at shows. And um, at a, a place called Larry's Comics in Lowell, uh, or it used to be in Lowell, uh, Massachusetts, uh, they were doing a uh, kind of a, uh, he was promoting his book, The Red Ten, there, and yeah. um, he had a character oxymoron, yeah. and uh, it was kind of a trick and draw thing, and everybody was drawing this guy, and I drew him, and he was like, "Hey, this is really good. Can I use this for like a variant cover for issue two? I was, so I was like, "Yeah, sure." Uh, from there, just kept on talking to him. I became friends with him and the rest of the comic tribe guys. Uh, for me, it was like uh, when I first started getting into writing. Um, Comics Tribe's website had a whole bunch of like. Uh, just kind of articles about like, um, you know, getting into making your own comics and things like that. So it was like really informative. And um, I was going to New York Comic Con and I saw that they had a booth. So I went over to introduce myself and I met um, Joe Mulvey, who's um, like, he's the artist on uh, another book I worked on called Wailing Blade with Comics Tribe. Yeah. And uh, so I met Joe and I met Tyler there and Joe and I just like really like hit it off. Like, like it was like, he just decided like, you're like, okay, we're going to be really good friends. So like, so we spent like the whole weekend, like we went to like, uh, went uh, to like a drink and draw event, like after that. And like, um, he, he, he's got a lot of funny stories. Joe's much better at telling them than I am. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but, um, but, um, a staple character of Palmer Strong, right? Yeah. And so who, who came up with him? That was Tyler. Uh, Tyler came up with him. And that's another thing. Uh, I, I want Tyler did, um, I think it was about halfway. He had the first half of the red 10 was like a 10 issue series. So he did the first five and then he did um, like an oxymoron special, which yeah. was an anthology. So Alex, you illustrated a story in that. Yeah, I wrote, I wrote a story in that. I also wrote a story in Joe, Joe's scam anthology. Yeah. So it was like little stuff like that to begin with. But like, uh, you know, that's kind of how Alex and I met was because we were both hanging around the comic shy booth at New York Comic Con and, and just sort of, you know, seeing each other. And I just like was a fan of Alex's work for, for a long time. And yeah. then I had the idea for Road of Bones. And I was like, take a look at this. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And, you know, luckily uh, he loved it and we put yeah. a kick-ass book out. Yeah. Well, yeah. Road of Bones absolutely is a kick-ass book. And oh, uh, I just loved thanks. it. I just went through it right away. Um, and I, I was wondering, because Rich, I know that you did like a little afterward where you talked about it in your in the trade um mm -hmm. but like did, did you have the idea of the setting first and then you came up with the story or like what was it the idea of like siberia that was appealing and russian folklore or um like like what came first for that story well that story it's kind of funny because i was just kind of doing research on uh prisons and prison breaks like i i felt like i uh, wanted to do something about like, like a very like kind of like a desperate prison break. Yeah. And so I was just looking all over like history, just sort not even really planning it as like a anything historical. Like it, it, like I didn't know if it may might have been like a sci-fi story or 
whatever was in my head at the time. But when I stumbled upon like uh, just kind of like some historical accounts of like the, the gulag and like, you know, what went on there. And the more I read, the more I was like, I can't believe nobody is like actually told a story in this setting, at, at least to my knowledge, you know, like it, you know, may, may exist or something, but I at least knew that there was no comic that I knew of that did it. So I, I so instead of like using that as like the inspiration for some fictional thing, I was like, uh, you know, this is like a real, real world horrific situation. Like, let's see what we could do there. Yeah. And, and you know, it, it's just so visceral and like, you really do feel for the three characters, the three main characters. And I was going to throw in a couple of spoilers for Road of Bones. So if you guys, if people at home haven't read it, just go on Comixology and get it because it's definitely worth the buy. And, um, but I was going to say like, you know, cannibalism plays a part in it. And, um, you know, Alex, I was going to ask you like, because there's brutality in the beginning in the Russian prison camp, and then there's cannibalism at the end of the story. Um, like, what do you use to reference that? Like, do you use horror movies? Do you use, like, anatomy books? Like, what do you use? I, I ate a couple of guys, you know. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, yeah, so, so, you're a cannibal, okay. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a method artist, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Um, no, yeah, um, yeah, a lot of that is, uh, for reference, um, oh, my God, yeah, for the uh, Gulag stuff, um, especially early on, that was, that was the most brutal. Because uh, I was, you know, uh, I'm going to... Let's see. Let's see if I can look up the guy's name while I'm talking to you. Sure. But uh, there was uh, there was somebody who was uh, a prisoner in the Gulag, who was uh, who was an illustrator. And yeah. uh, after the fact, he drew all these things. There's a couple of guys that did this. And uh, so all the uh, everything that everybody's wearing, and like the settings and all that, I took like straight from this guy's illustrations. Oh wow. And um, let's see if I can. Well, anyway, um, if you just Google like Gulag. Uh, Gulag uh, illustrations that's i mean that's how i looked him up and that's he's just down the list and yeah you can uh yeah the the outfits that they're wearing are straight from these guys uh drawings yeah and um but um yeah and then like reading some stories and everything in there and it's just you know all that stuff is just brutal yeah and uh but uh as far as like uh drawing the gore and all that i mean that's just from uh drawing like just being a fan of horror movies um and just uh just that and look at, looking at other artists. Uh, there's a lot of, I mean, uh, like uh, one of my favorite artists is uh, Ryan Otley who did Invincible and yeah. now, Spider-Man is a big deal now, but some of the gore that I uh, used to do was fantastic. And oh, yeah. I used to have like one of his books open, like on my desk, like all the time looking at what he did. Right. Um, and, um, and for like a lot of like the he heavy shadows and stuff like that, you know, I was, like had like a bunch of Frank Miller books open and okay. uh, um, for scenery, there was that. And also, once we started this book, I just moved to Vermont. I'm from Massachusetts and uh, okay. myself, my wife, my son, we moved up to Vermont and like, and winter had just started. So a lot of the mountains and all that, like the, especially the lighting yeah. was based off of uh, the, the mountains I drove through just to drive my son to daycare every morning. Oh, okay. And uh, so because daycare started early, we would drive through, the sun was rising. Yeah. So a lot of those colors were based on, you know, the mountains that I drove past. The only difference is I just knocked out all the trees. <laughs> okay, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, See, I actually was going to ask you about, like, what you use as reference for that, for, like, the tundra yeah. and Siberia. Yeah. And so, okay, that's, that's interesting. It's like, you know, American countries side or whatever influence in right. the story. That's interesting. <laughs> so, 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 Rich, like, you, you had to research Russian folklore then and then also this whole gulag scenario as well, right? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And then you said in the afterward too that you're you're part Russian too, right? Like uh, your ancestry. Yeah, yeah. yeah my, on my uh, my my on my mother's side, my my grandfather was born uh, in Russia and actually came came here. I think when he was about four or five years old, something like that. Like right yeah. around right around the turn of the century, like 1900s. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then my 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 grandmother, her family is like from like. Lithuania, Poland, like the same region. So, um, you know, there's a lot of like kind of overlap in terms of like, you know, the folklore and, and, and things like that. So, you know, that like, even so that, that's sort of just stuff like, it was like the springboard, like I did do a lot of research into like, you know, 
um, both folklore and also like the gulag stuff. Like there's actually a couple of really good like um, like firsthand accounts written by prisoners. Um, there's this one book uh, called uh, One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich by Alexander, and I'm going to screw up his last name, but Soledson, I believe it is. Okay. And anyway, it's a really great uh, book. It's literally just one day in the life of a prisoner at one of these camps. And it is like brutal. And, and like uh, the interesting thing about that is that um, he published it after he, the author was a prisoner and he published it uh, after he was released. But since he was living under the Soviet regime, he had to publish it as fiction. Oh, okay. Because if he, if he had just said it was like an autobiography, he probably would have gotten into trouble again. Right. As, as a work of fiction, it's, I guess it kind of like bended the rules enough to where like he didn't, he didn't get in trouble, but it's a very, really like really good book. Like, uh, if, you know, if, if people are interested in kind of like, uh, you know, like kind of like a firsthand account of like what it was really like. Um, and, you know, like I drew from that, I drew from a lot of other like kind of historical things that happened. Um, like the thing in the beginning, uh, in the first few pages of like the, uh, the old guy uh, kind of getting buried in the road, like, you know, that, that obviously it was a dramatization, but that stuff really did happen. Like the reason it's called the road of bones is because they literally paved over over the bodies of the workers that died on the way it was like you know a really horrible thing and i think that's like one of the things that kind of like captivated me about the story was that you have this like you know kind of real life horror and uh and this fictional kind of horror thing that we're creating and just sort of raising the question of like you know well what's worse, like the kind of like ghost story we're telling right. or the fact that this like really happened to, to people. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and I think that like the real life aspect really bothers me the most, even though I really like the creature yeah. too and the creature design. Um, but like, I was really intrigued by the like criminal system within the gulag itself. Mm -hmm. And then I liked the backstory for how each character was like placed at the prison, like especially how the main character just is basically there because he told a joke about Stalin. And yeah. I'm guessing that that stuff is stuff that you would cover during your research. Yeah, yeah. There were basically kind of like two uh, casts of prisoners, if you will. There, there were the criminals and then there were the political prisoners. And the political prisoners were a lot of like uh, intellectuals and, uh, and again, yeah, people from just walks of, all walks of life who maybe said the wrong thing or in front of the wrong person. Um, even, even people who like, you know, let's say you, uh, someone was actually telling me that they had, had a relative that this happened to, like, you know, the, he owned, he, he was like a farm owner and the, the, the state wanted to seize his farm. So they just created some like, you know, trumped up charges to, uh, you know, throw them in there. But the thing was, it was like, you know, you could get like a 10 or 20 year sentence, but the life expectancy in the place was like about a year. So, you know, you really kind of had to, you know, it, it was just really like tough living. And the, and the thing was, it's like, um, you know, like in a lot of prisons, they had these like gangs that were like the criminal gangs. And uh, some of them even like persist to this day. Um, but it's like, imagine you're, you're this like intellectual, like college professor, never worked like a day of physical labor in your life. And like all of a sudden you're in this camp being worked to death, surrounded by like some of like the worst people, like criminals who, who would like, you know, kill you just as soon as look at you. And that's like, it just all kind of contributed to just sort of like the, just the raw, like horror of like that situation. Yeah. I think that's the reason why I enjoyed your book so much is because I like to see glimpses of that, of history, just to like really appreciate what we have now. You yeah. Know? It's like, there's so many things we can complain about our world now, but when we see that, we're like, oh my God, it could be so much worse. And, and you guys did a phenomenal job just capturing that in, you know, that, that limited series. That was great. Yeah. Um, and, 
I think, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Sorry. And I think also in like, um, you know, in America, like we we're, we're kind of like, like Hollywood sort of like took up, um, you know, like the Holocaust and, and, and things like that in Nazi Germany, which is really important to learn about. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. Um, it, you know, but I think we're, we're kind of like more well-versed in that than we are with the stories of like the Russian Gulag because in part because of the Cold War and, you know, there not a lot of like um, information exchange between like America and Russia until more recently. So I, I sort of like, you know, hope that Rhoda Bones can at least like, you know, it is like a fantasy story and, and it, it, you know, it is like uh, not meant to like kind of uh, replace like any of the real world stuff. But my hope is that people would like look at it, find it interesting, and then maybe like learn a little bit about like the real world stuff as well. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I'm definitely more intrigued by the whole Gulag scenario too, you know? And, mm -hmm. and, and the thing is, there's not a lot of movies. It's like what you said. There's not a lot of movies. Like, the only kind of movie about Soviet Russia I can think of that I've seen within the past like decade or two was uh, Enemy at the Gates. Do you guys remember that one with the snipers? Oh, mm -hmm. a little bit. Like yeah. that's that's the biggest mainstream American movie I've seen about Soviet Russia in the past like yeah. two decades. And there's a lot of independent movies and certainly like, foreign films, but it's it's definitely a subject that's not touched upon often. Yeah. Yeah, it's like uh, James Bond's in there. Or oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we kind of like, yeah, that. <laughs> you got the eighties like cartoon Russians are like right. You know, Boris and Natasha, like yeah. uh, <laughs> you know. So, so let me ask you guys because you know this this is not like what when people think comic books they don't necessarily think this. Now obviously you know, yeah. we all love the industry so we know there's a wide range of stories but like when you guys set out like. Like Alex, when you set out to be an artist, like a comic book artist, did you want to draw horror, or or did you want to draw superheroes? Like, like what was your goal starting out? Um, my goal was uh, was basically just I, I kind of just wanted to be an illustrator, and I was really into horror, and, and uh, just I was kind of just uh, gravitated toward that. Uh, like I got into it to, um, well. The, my whole thing is uh, I started off with animation and okay. I wanted to go that route. And um, uh, luckily for me, I started looking for work in 2008 when, uh, you know, everything in the, like the recession hit and all that. So I couldn't find a job to save my life. I, I contacted every English speaking country in the world and they all said, you got nothing. Um, and um, so, uh, and I did some things with that and that kind of turned into, and I did like some of my own animations, put them in the festivals and all that, but nothing really clicked. And I figured, well, you know, why don't I just break it down and kind of do comic books? And um, and that kind of got into, so I, I wasn't really looking to like, you know, I, I really want to draw Batman one day, which I mean, that'd be great, but that's not why I got into it. I wanted to just use art to tell stories. Yeah. And, um, and I, I've just been a horror fan anyways and um so it kind of built into just getting into horror stuff yeah and and you know it's fun to draw <laughs> yeah and, and so from what i've seen of your work like i, I saw um you know oxymoron and i saw rota bones and it, there's like a lot of like gruesome stuff so like so in general you're kind of drawn towards that oh yeah yeah uh it doesn't hurt it doesn't help either that uh when i got started i i discovered the movie um uh, uh dead alive oh, okay. <laughs> so i was like so yeah i, I like uh grindhouse just came out so i was really in that then i found uh, dead alive soon after that so yeah. like when i was getting started drawing i was really into like gory movies for, like all of a sudden so That's i was awesome. like all right when i'm gonna do these let's make them like really over the top and like let's have some fun yeah and uh which i'm still into all the stuff but um uh but yeah all the gory stuff in there i was like yeah like and it was also, also probably frustration of not being able to get a job, like in general with animation and all that stuff. Right. So I was like, all right, like I'm frustrated. So I'm going to, you know, gonna turn this guy inside out somehow. <laughs> we do an awesome job doing that. And, and like, <laughs> yeah. And then Rich, I was going to say, um, I know that in one of your, either it was afterward or like in, in a um, interview that you did, you were talking about that you were kind of like a fantasy sci-fi kind of guy. And that like wrote a bone is sort of different for you because it was hard. Um, oh yeah. So so like was that your goal like to write like uh, fantasy and sci-fi comics or did you want to write 
fantasy and sci-fi novels? Like, like basically, like, what was your comic trajectory like? Well, I, yeah, I guess, like, um, I mean, I read comics when I was a kid, and, like, it was all, like, superhero comics and stuff like that, and then kind of fell out of it when I got a little bit older, but then I came back to it, and, and the stuff that brought me back was a lot of these, like, uh, like Vertigo titles and, uh, you know, some of the more mature stuff where it was branching out from, like, superheroes into, like, sci-fi fantasy stuff, like Sandman was a big one, um, you know, so I think, like, it, it just sort of broadened my mind to, like, what you could do in terms of, like, uh, like comics. Like, it made me see it as more of, like, a medium as opposed to, like, just superheroes. So, yeah. Um, so that was that. And then, like, as far as, like, writing goes, like, I guess you could call me, like, a frustrated novelist because, like, uh, I tried to write, like, science fiction and fantasy novels, like, few times and what would happen is it's like I'd get started write a bunch run out of steam kind of like lose lose track not not know where to go from there I'm gonna try it again before 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 the end of my life I hope but, you know <laughs> with a little bit of ex experience under my belt but I, I really just sort of found like uh like when I discovered like comic scripting it was just uh Kind of like the light bulb went off like i was like ah oh, okay i could do this and and i can finish stuff and so i started small with like some short stories kind of got got a handle on the form then started doing longer ones yeah um but yeah like i never really thought of myself as a horror writer like i i always enjoyed horror but i was always like you know like a fantasy sci-fi guy so yeah um it turns out i'm pretty good at it which is like weird but like, <laughs> but it was like it was like nobody was more shocked than i was to see like a horror book yeah uh, now, yeah it's funny you got, like when you told me the story i just assumed like oh i must like I, I figured you probably had like five or six horror stories like already like done that i just hadn't seen yet yeah yeah so yeah i had no idea also that like that was your first go yeah <laughs> well so then like your your next go is sea of sorrows right and yeah. I know that I read somewhere that it's sort of like a spiritual sequel to Road of Bones. And, and so, yeah. like, it's about a uh, diving crew trying to salvage a World War I ship, right? right. Yeah. And, and then, so, can, can you guys just kind of tell us a little bit more about, like, the plot of the, the book and, like, what we can expect from it? Sure. Yeah. yeah so, I mean, I suppose. It, it, it's, it's basically what you said. It's like, it's like a salvage crew in the post world war one era they they uh get hired to uh uh go find a sunken u-boat that uh is supposedly full of gold and they find it but they also find something else so um yeah. and uh and there's a lot of kind of uh we'll call it ulterior motives among the crew you know different factions and and uh revolving around the gold but also revolving a lot around uh kind of i guess you could call it trauma from from world war ii of like you know because uh, oh, world war one I'm, I'm sorry uh because a lot of the these crew members are, are people who went through that and are haunted by the experience so um but I think that I like. I'll let Alex chime in in a minute because he, he has a good uh, kind of uh, take on it too. But I think like the idea was like we didn't really want to do Road of Bones too, like you know, yeah, Roman, Roman in America or something like that. You know, it just sort of, <laughs> it just sort of seemed like uh, like we just. I think we both really liked where it ended, and we didn't really want to kind of uh, dampen like I guess the questions that the you know uh people had like one of you know we get i get i get asked all the time like you know what do you, you know what did that mean like that last panel you know or, or like kind of like I, I guess you know was it all in his head was it real like stuff like that so right. you know we didn't really want to kind of uh break that so we were just like well what else could we do and we were thinking about like you know what did we really like about road of bones and like part of it was like uh, the historical setting part of it was the psychological aspect so we were just sort of trying to find like um 
just ways to uh, bring the same flavor, uh, same kind of story, but like tell something completely new, almost like in a way of like American Horror Story or yeah. like, uh, you know, what was the one you said, Alex? Like, like, uh, like yeah, I was saying the dead, yeah, like the, uh, the uh, yeah, the uh, whatever the Cornada or Cornada. Ice cream oh, trilogy, the one that uh, Edgar yeah, Wright. Edgar Wright, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so like, uh, Rota Bones would have been Shaun of the Dead. This is like uh, Hot Fuzz. Right, right. <laughs> so it's like a sequel, but it's like it's not a sequel. Right. Me. Yeah. Uh, and, and you know, yeah. So Alex, speaking of your contribution, I think I read in an interview with you guys that like you wanted to have this feeling that like even though there's this big open ocean, that yeah. something could just pop up at you at any second, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that idea. That, that kind of got me like real anxious to read yeah. your book. Like it comes out in November, right? Uh, that's, yeah, yeah, right, right. November eighteenth. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, like, so <clears throat> drawing this underwater environment, right? Like, what what are your influences there? Uh, yeah, all the underwater stuff. Um, uh, it's basically just uh, just imagining. Um, yeah, trying to think. Uh, it's it just uh, like a kind of almost like an alien type of area where it's you can only like like thinking of just what it would be like underwater like you only got like you got your one lamp which can only like you can only see so much it's this huge area it goes on for miles up and down everywhere but you can only see like this bubble around you like basically just you and basically like you know like maybe six feet in front of you and, yeah. and so just thinking like all right what it's, i mean who knows what's in there Right, right. Uh, like uh, not to spoil it I don't think it's going to spoil anything but there's one part he's just walking and bam a just shark just pops right in front of his face and he's just oh. like holy that <laughs> and it's just like well that's how it would be you know it's right. I don't know if that's the one shark there's like 15 sharks and the thing is and also they can all see you because you got this light on yeah. but it's so I mean what, just what a creepy atmosphere to be in Absolutely. and uh, so really trying to keep it like keep it at that. Like you can only see so much. You can only get like hints of things. And, um, and like when they're looking for that ship, it's like, well, it, like, you know, it's just it kind of imagine I just, like I said, like what else could be down here? Um, right. it could be nothing. It could be anything, you know, and just, just good luck sucker. Real beautiful covers too. I, I love that cover with like the diving suit and, and the skull face. And it looks like there's another yeah. cover that has like a mermaid on it too, right? Yeah, yeah. It, yeah we got the that first cover, yeah, where he's like, uh, it's it's got our guy like swimming up, and then we got the uh, she's coming up uh, right underneath them, either to I don't know, do something, <laughs> <It's> <laughs> like, either check it out. Like, it's a very uh, creature of the Black Lagoon shot, you know, where they're trying to get out of there, and yeah. here he is, he's kind of like, all right, is it, you know, is, is it going to be bad news for him? Probably, reminds, yeah, uh, or is he a lot like, of. Uh, like yeah. Jaws too, in a way, you know, like like the right, you know, yeah, with the yeah, the, exactly, yeah, like the swimmer on top, and then danger coming yeah. up from underneath. Yeah, I like that we're doing this. I think this you said it's a podcast, right? No one's gonna see our hands doing it. Oh, this. Is actually a YouTube video. Oh, oh. is it YouTube? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can do any kind of hand gestures you want. It's all good. You know, do hook them horns or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so. um I was going to say that, like, how many issues are in the, the series for Sea of Sorrows? Uh, sea of Sorrows is going to be five issues. Five issues. Um, Road of Bones was four. And uh, I think part of the reason why is because it's like, it's three guys walking through the mountains. So it's like, if we were going to add a fifth issue, it would pretty much have been that. So <laughs> just like, not, not the most interesting thing to, like, look at for, like, yeah. you know. <laughs> and and they went over some rock again all right great <laughs> yeah it's like oh, look, more rocks you know yeah, more yeah. weight um, you know it's funny like we, oh, so, oh go ahead, i'm sorry i'm sorry see so as we have like a little bit of a larger cast and a little bit more of like uh uh kind of intrigue so we we thought like we, we had had enough to to fill like a little bit more more room is, is the missing ship is that based on a real ship too from world war one yeah. Actually, it is um, the uh, the U boat is called Bremen, and there was an actual U boat called Bremen uh, that was one of two U boats sent by um, this was before America had joined the war. Um, 
it was still, there was sort of a question like of whether it was going to join uh, on uh, the side of, of the allies or the side of the, uh, you know, Germany and, um, and again, this is World War One, so we're not talking about like the Nazis, we're talking about like the Kaiser. Um, but anyway, so, uh, but there was a, a blockade uh, of, of British ships. So Germany had sent these two ships with, uh, with money to try to purchase uh, uh, weapons from, from, from America for, for the war effort because America at the time was neutral. Uh, so I forget the name of the other ship. That one actually did make it through, but the Bremen was just lost at sea. And there was no kind of, uh, there was, um, there was no record of like who actually sank it. Like it was most likely sank by like depth charges or something like that, but it was not confirmed. So it was just sort of like, just like a minor mystery, you know, like, and I think that was kind of like the hook into like the real world. Like, like I was like, ah, Perfect. You know, like, yeah, there we go. There, there's our, there's our uh, historical mystery that we can kind of like, you know, tie this back to like um, reality. Yeah. So yeah, it is, it is a real ship. The story behind why it was where it was is real, but you know, in, in real life, nobody knows what happened to it. So it's fair game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So did you guys have to do like extensive research on like diving equipment from that time? Like, like, you know, for story purposes and then for art purposes, too. Yeah. Yeah. And we tell you, that was not easy because it's like, it's hard enough to find, like, I mean, like, you can find, like, you know, the generalities of it, like, pretty easily. But, like, you know, you got to be like, okay, well, technically, they were able to go, like, 300 meters down. But that was, like, a world record setting thing. So, it's only, you know, so what we're realistically looking at is like 150 meters down. So what parts of the ocean is that like possible for, you know, like uh, we landed on the Flemish cap, which is uh, relatively shallow as far as the North Atlantic goes. But it's like, again, like, I don't think anybody's like going to be out there, like kind of rigorously fact checking us and being on Twitter, like being like, you know, this regulator that Alex drew was not part of standard scuba gear right. until 1935. Right. But, you know, I, I think like, it's just part of like, you know, your due diligence to try and get as much of this stuff correct as you can. So, so we did do a bunch of research. It's just like, you know, it, it's tricky to look up because when you're looking up like, um, you know, the technology of like, uh, like, deep sea diving it's like you kind of a lot of it focuses on scuba and like Jacques Cousteau and things like that which is stuff that happened way after like what we did and and you know it's like it's hard enough to find like uh what like uh I don't know like like a diving lantern like looks like you know if you type like if you're looking for like a vintage diving lantern it's like well you want to make sure that like it's around the same time area and stuff, but it's like, you know, a lot, it, like one thing I didn't know really was that like deep sea diving and salvage stuff has been going on since like, I think like the seven, 16 or 1700s. Oh, like wow. it was very primitive back then. Right. You know, it was like, like they didn't like, they didn't have diving suits, but they had like wooden diving bells and things that went down. Like, like it's a technology that's evolved over like a few centuries, like much longer than I thought. Right. So, you know, there, there's like a lot to sift through, but uh, then Alex, I mean, I don't know about, you want to talk about like, you know, finding like reference for like your stuff? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no. Uh, yeah. For me, it was a lot of, uh, I mean, you know, thank God I live at the time I do because I can just jump on Google. Um, and uh, luckily also my, uh, my parents are in Cape Cod and um, uh, growing up, we would always go to Cape Cod in the summers and um uh, so there's a lot of places that like maritime, like museums all over the, like you can't throw a rock without hitting something. <laughs> uh, and, um, and so there's a lot of places I went and checked out that like old pirate museums, all like that. Right. And, um, and uh, here, I'll even show you this. Hold on. Uh, even got this guy uh, for, oh, there you go. <laughs> uh, that my wife gave me uh, a few anniversaries ago that I kind of based our helmet off. I changed it up a little bit. 
Yeah. But they just had this guy hanging out here my right by my uh, desk working. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, and then a lot of it, just trying to make sure that it was pre-World War II, like it was around 19, between 1900 and 1930 and trying my, trying my best. And I'm sure if any hardcore guys will probably write me be like, yeah, I, you know, you know, actually that hose actually goes in this part of the helmet, not in the yeah. back where you have it or, and that type of thing. And, um, <laughs> You know, it, 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 it's, it's kind of one of those, listen, if that's what you're concentrating on, not the rest of it, then I blew it. <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. If, hopefully you're looking at like trying to figure out who these characters are, what, what kind of danger they're in, what, what their goals are, opposed to, uh, you know, actually that was a button, not a zipper type of thing. Yeah. And, um, and but yeah, but, you know, we, we did our homework and, uh, and yeah, you know, it's, I think it looks good. So yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I was just going to say, hopefully we won't have a mob of, you know, I'll never be able to go to Cape Cod again. <laughs> uh, you know, protesting yeah. Or anything, so. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, like, when you write a historical story, are there a lot of people that, like, send messages like, oh, actually, you know, like, does that happen a lot or? Uh, not yet. Uh, yeah, we're, we're opening ourselves up here. We're going to get hammered now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we really screwed up here. Yeah. yeah, yeah I, don't know. I, I like, feel like if you were writing a novel, you might get that kind of crowd, right? But with comics, I think that the fans are just so hungry to see something different besides superheroes, right? Yeah. Like, like people that like are around our age, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, we would I think, get more flack if like uh, I was drawing Superman and I screwed up like, you know, he's like, he's got actually like four rings on his belt, not three. You know, it, like that time. Yeah. Exactly. That's what I was going to say. I mean, like, you know, in a funny thing, like, it, it's almost, um, you know, it can kind of work both ways. Like, like when we were at New York Comic Con last year, um, we did a signing for the book and one of the guys came up, or this guy came up to us and said that he actually uses certain pages from Road of Bones uh, in his history class for when he talks about gulag because i mean like he's a history teacher and, and obviously like he kind of edits it he's not showing the students like the cannibalism parts and stuff like that yeah. but, uh, but just the he just uses that as an example of like you know when he talks about the camps of like what life was like in there so i mean you know like not to say that this guy's like an authority but it's like you know if it passes muster with a history teacher that's you know not a bad thing so yeah yeah. You know, um, Rich, I, I know that you've written for uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles too, right? For IDW. Yeah. I've, mm -hmm. I've read a ton of the Ninja Turtles stuff. So, like, I, I wasn't always paying attention to, like, who wrote what. But yeah. I've read, like, the miniseries and the ongoing and stuff. Like, what, what did you write for Ninja Turtles? Um, so there was this uh, series that ran for, I think, 25 issues. Uh, it was called Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Universe. Yeah. Um, so TMNT Universe, the idea there was, was sort of like uh, back different stories that were like kind of like um, a little more diverse than the main storyline. So yeah. you would have some where it was like side missions for turtles or focusing on secondary characters um, that were introduced in the series. But, you know, maybe because the main series had like a very direct storyline, they didn't really get as much love as they could have. Um, so I wrote issue number 11 of TMNT Universe oh, nice. that was focusing on a couple of the uh, members of the Mighty Mutanimals team. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then I wrote, um, I wrote two backups in, I think it was issues 23 and 24, and those are just short stories. Uh, again, uh, with a couple of the Mutanimals and then uh, one of the backup characters called Nobody. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, so I have so, read that. Yes. Cause so like the kind of joke I make is like, yes, I've worked on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but I've never actually written a turtle. Oh, okay. <laughs> like, like people have asked me like, what was your favorite turtle to write? And I'm like, I did not get a chance to write one. So yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> someday, you know, someday hopefully we'll be back uh, and get a chance to do that. But yeah, those are, it was issue number 11 and then it was the backups and I, I think it was 23 and 24. Um, but yeah, I had a great time and it was, you know, also like 
really eye-opening because it's like was kind of like the first chance I got to work in something where there was like uh, kind of like a larger universe and a larger continuity, you yeah. know? Yeah. So like introducing a lot of other stuff to sort of keep in mind, like as I was writing the story, like, you know, uh, you well, you can't have this one do that because this is not established in the world or, you know, even pitching it, it was like, you know, um, we really liked the idea that, that we did, but there was like, you know, I would, I'd sent a whole bunch of ideas. Oh, one second, buddy. Sorry, it's my son. Oh, I can't relate. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now pants. Good for you. He's wearing pants. He's proud of himself. Um, anyway, um, so there were ideas that I pitched where they would say like, oh, sorry, you can't use this character because they're currently dead or, or something like that. So right. you know, it's like a lot to think about that I hadn't thought about before. Yeah. And, and see, like, that's the kind of book where I do think that you would get fan pushback or people by pointing out things versus the historical yeah. stuff. Yeah. So, um, Alex, I was going to ask you, is there, like, a particular uh, franchise that you would like to work on or, or that you have worked on? Like, I was going through your stuff. It looks like it's a lot of in indie books, right? Yeah, all my, all my stuff is, like, independent stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, Sin City. <laughs> <laughs> really, Sin City. Okay, that's interesting. I get so murdered, but yeah, that'd be fun. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome, man. Uh, yeah, uh, but uh, yeah, but that's not gonna happen. Um, yeah, uh, like a lot of the stuff, like uh, you know, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, a lot of the big two. Sure, I'll jump on any other one of those, just you know, for fun. I'd love to do a turtles book. That would be a blast. Yeah. Um, I, you know what I'll say? Uh, my my all time favorite movie is uh, Indiana Jones. So uh, I don't I don't even know if they're doing any Indiana Jones books right now. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd I'd love to do uh, one one of those. I think that'd be a blast. Yeah. Uh, but again, that's that's more that's a movie more than a than a comic series. Yeah. Um, but and, and that's the thing. I'm I'm I I love doing the like the independent stuff. It's so much fun. Yeah. And um. And like I was saying before, if I never do uh, like a, like a big two book or anything like that, or capes or anything like that, uh, the stuff I'm doing right now, I'm psyched. And like I'm I'm currently in my dream job, so I'm you know I couldn't be happier. That's awesome. And um, so yeah, more independent stuff, more crazy stuff, more uh, hard sci-fi adventure. I I'll try a comedy uh, <laughs> again. And um, uh, but yeah, no. Um, but yeah, uh, Indiana Jones would be fun. I'll take Batman. I'll take uh, uh, you know Superman would be pretty cool just because he's the OG. Um, uh, but yeah, um, I, I would love to see a, like an Arkham, like Batman in Arkham Asylum, drawn by you. Like yeah, I, think cool. awesome. yeah. I, I can picture like Killer Croc drawn in your style. You know, and yeah. definitely like a Joker. Yeah, yeah it'd be awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a, I, I like to do a, a Riddler book would be a lot of fun. A Riddler, Riddler was my I love that guy when I was a kid. Oh yeah, yeah, and I, I solely I think it's because he wore green, and when I was little, my favorite color was green. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Um, so you know, so you guys obviously worked on at least two projects together, um, and you guys know each other, and you're, I can tell you guys are definitely friends. Like, what's it like working with each other? Like, do you send full scripts to Alex Rich, and then like, do you guys kind of go back and forth with notes, or how, how does that work? I just tell Alex, just do what you want to do, and like, I'll put, I'll put my name on it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I write I write full scripts, but like I, I found like with like Sea of Stars, like it's almost like um they like I can give the the scripts kind of like are getting a little bit like shorter and less kind of like um wordy, I guess is the word for it, because I know like like if I was writing if I was just writing a script and I didn't know who was like going to illustrate it I, I would take extra care to like really explain like exactly what I was what I was envisioning you know but knowing Alex and, and knowing what his instincts are and 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 what he's capable of I trust him so much that I could just sort of say like yeah you know this is underwater like I don't need it to be like you know and we see two sea anemones over here and, and you know what I mean yeah. but like um, I really like know that like whatever I ask for, he's going to do. And I'm also not super, I, I don't like being super prescriptive in my scripts because I don't, I don't, I don't want 
Alex or anybody I work with to sort of feel like a pair of hands that's just like, you know, uh, executing what I'm telling them to do. Like, I like to give a little room for, you know, Alex to do his thing because he's like super good at what he does. And, and you know, that's why I wanted to work with him. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, you know, there is like a little bit of back and forth. Like um, a lot of what I try and do is, is like so much sort of like get across the intent of the scene and then let him let Alex figure out the best way to render it. So like, I might say something like, I want this to really feel claustrophobic, you know, uh, and then, you know, let him figure out the best way to do that. Right. Yeah. And then Alex, have you ever gotten like a script from Rich and like, you were like, oh my God, I don't know how the heck I'm going to draw that. Or like, oh, you're like super excited about drawing a specific thing. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. We, just, he just sent me the script for the, uh, uh, issue four and uh there's this uh a couple things in here i'm just like oh all right let's let's get cracking this is gonna be fun I, like oh i can't wait to do this one um and um but yeah no there's a there's a bunch of stuff yeah um uh, yeah uh to, to kind of go back to get, like give an example like, even like um like in road of bones when it finally gets down to like the cannibalism scene i'm like oh all right let's 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 really mess this guy up <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and um, and also like uh, oh, especially the uh, not to give anything away with Road of Bones in case anybody's like on like halfway through issue three and they haven't read issue four yet, but like the uh, like that last page in issue four, um, that was like a okay, this is gonna be fun. This is I'm like you know I'm not doing anything for a while. I'm just working on this page and this is gonna be just a blast to do. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, a lot of the like the a lot of the like the background scenes too in these, um, like uh, like a lot of the like wide shots of the ocean have been a, a ton of fun to do. Yeah. And um, and like uh, and, like this is I, I've told a story before, but like when we started this, um, I told Rich like yeah, I always wanted to draw a story that takes place in the snow, and I always wanted to take so do something that takes place in the ocean. And uh, so yeah, so drawing these backgrounds in this like just the nature of everything. Like, uh, like when he's underwater, when he, they're above water, just looking out on just the waves and all that. It's just uh, the whole thing. It's been, it's been great. Yeah. You know, it has, it has been like a, okay, gotta draw this thing one more time. And like, here we go. But, uh, yeah, yeah I mean, yeah, it's, it's, uh, you know, both books have been just, uh, been an absolute pleasure to draw. And yeah, I, I can't wait to get cracking on this next one. This one's gonna be a lot of fun. <laughs> so do you have the same, rest of the creative team too like do you have the same letter and the same inker and justin yeah colors? justin birch justin birch he's uh alex has been doing um he's been doing the, the line art and, and the color uh with some assists from uh from uh yeah this time around uh my my buddy uh mark laney he's uh he's doing the flats and then i'm coming in and doing like the uh, what i'll call the special effects like little shadows lighting uh mm -hmm. you know if, if someone gets if there's blood there's gonna be i'll do the blood splatter that type of thing i'll do like and uh but yeah i wrote a bones is all me and then uh, this one just yeah. uh yeah I, I got my buddy mark to help out wait, wait, yeah, he's no. got a great book called ninja bear which i'll uh plug real quick yeah um uh, red salad media and go read his book too yeah. ninja bear but yeah ju just just ninja bear. justin's been the letterer on both like he, he did some great stuff and wrote a bones with like kind of uh I guess uh, getting across like the kind of cold, you know, kind of feel to it with like he used a few special effects with like the, you know, um, like the the uh, the word balloons and and these he's work he's been doing some stuff on CSRs with like the underwater stuff too. So oh, that's cool. So uh, yeah, he's great. Justin's yeah. like super nice guy, easy to work with, and and just really really talented. So yeah, so no reason to. No reason to rock the boat, you know? It's like, <laughs> yeah, pun intended. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, because that was one thing, too, that I loved about Road of Bones was, like, the, the stark contrast between the white scenery and then just this, like, brutal, just, bloody yeah, scenery. Yeah. Like, where the whole, almost the whole page is blood, you know? I, mean, I love yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So uh, I, I had one last question for you guys uh, before we wrap it up. I was going to say, like, well, what's it like working in the industry right now with COVID and stuff, like I'm sure there's like a big shift, right? Like, because like, how long have you guys been 
full time, like going to cons and, and working in the industry. And then like, what's it like now versus what it has been? No, I mean, I, I think, oh, you want to go? Do you have something no. else? Okay. I was going to say like, like, you know, it really has been like uh, a crazy year because things have uh, slowed down a lot. You know, even I think it's only now that they're starting to sort of get back to something close to normal, but even so you, you still don't have conventions. You still really don't have like signings at, at, at stores and things like that. So there's this kind of like whole social aspect to it that has just sort of been knocked out. Like as far as the industry itself goes, you know, not only was, uh, hello, not, <laughs> not only did you have the kind of big slow down and shut down in like around March and May and stuff, but then you kind of lost a lot of the summer to like catching up. So, you know, Sea of Stars is originally supposed to come out in May. Um, but I think we're actually lucky that it didn't because probably the worst thing for the book would have been to have one issue out and then the rest of it sort of in limbo. It was like, it kind of worked out better to where we're just saying like, okay, well, we'll just take it all off the table and bring it back when we can, which, which happens to be November. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it was just like, um, this, this whole year has just been like, like a roller coaster. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's definitely different, definitely slower, but I mean, like one of the things, one of the great things about comics is like, you know, so many of like the creators and, and, and like people I'm friendly with are very much like, DIY people and like, let's figure out a way to do it. So, you know, I think we've all been like, just working, still working really hard and, and, and trying to find new ways to just get our stuff out there. So, so that's been good. It's like, you know, it's not all negative. There, there's definitely kind of like a, like people, like just from the creative perspective, like, pe like people like pulling together and like, you know, helping each other out. And yeah. stuff like that absolutely, absolutely. And especially right now i mean you know this would be the first day back from new york comic-con and uh yeah. which is like is one of those that i didn't really hit because i mean new york is always a blast because i mean that's where me and uh, rich and i really get to know each other yeah uh and it's kind of like be able to see all your friends from all over all over the place yeah and um yeah, it's just been uh, like yeah, like Rich said. I mean, the series would have been out by now if you know if it was any other year, we'd have been done by now, and yeah. uh, we'd be talking about what are we going to trade and all that type of thing. And, um, and so yeah, I mean, it's it's been funny like sitting on the stuff since like January <laughs> wow. and being like excited to get it out there, and uh, it's it's still about a month away, and. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And I'm, I, and to me, like it's like, oh yeah, that's that's all kind of older stuff, and and right, uh, right. Um, you're like working on so much other new stuff. Yeah, well, yeah. so yeah, for my sake, yeah, any uh, anything with kind of uh, like yeah, most stuff got on pause, um, and then and luckily for me, you know, I I've known like I know like you know other like uh, writers that like I have this idea it's not connected to anybody. Do you want to do it? Sure, let's let's get cracking. And um, so, yeah, I've, you know, I've been lucky that I've been basically to be able to work through this whole mess and uh, been able to keep busy. And uh, luckily for me, you know, I, I work full time as an artist, so it's not like I got kicked out of my day job and had to do, go back to this. And so, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, basically, I'm looking forward to be over. I <laughs> wanted things to be like, all right, enough's enough. Let's, uh, yeah. Uh, when somebody said, uh, I could really go for some, uh, just precedent at times right about now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Here, I read it somewhere on Twitter, but yeah. 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 Well, I was going to say, cause I know Rich, you live in New Jersey, right? Yeah. I'm in, uh, yeah. Like pretty close to New York city, but yeah. In, yeah. In Jersey. I, I'm, I'm originally from uh, Staten Island. So oh, okay. I, I live in Austin, Texas now, but, um, I grew, I grew up in Queens. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah. And then Alex, are you in the New York area too? No, I'm in uh, Vermont. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I was gonna say, yeah, like, where, where I am, it's like uh, it's you knock 
kind of would. We're like one of the three states where things like, all right, things are kind of back to normal. Yeah, <laughs> is, that's cool. That's I, awesome. I think last I checked, it was us, New Hampshire, and Maine. Wow. That's and, cool. uh, and, you know, and that was like a, a month ago. So who knows now? Yeah. Well, I was, I was going to say that if I ever make it to New York Comic Con again, because I used to go when I lived there, and you guys were there, I'd love to, like, you know, just oh, yeah. you guys in person. Oh, yeah. Well, out. yeah, yeah stop by and say, hey, because yeah. we're, no. we're, that's like the one. <laughs> The one con that, like, you know, I really like want, like, and made an effort to go to, like, every every single year. Or so, yeah. yeah. And, and then, like, if you guys are ever doing like a signing or something in Austin, Texas, you know, just let me know because I'll definitely come. You know, sure. Oh, yeah. Say hi and bring some people too. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, yeah. I'd love to see Austin. Just uh, being yeah. a Robert Rodriguez fan, <laughs> just to see what it's like down there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a great place, and uh, there's a lot of cool, creative people here too. You know, yeah. but not, not so much on the comic scene, but definitely like with movies, like you were saying. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I, want, I want to go down and uh, and have some some brisket. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, into, I'm into barbecuing, but I can only do so much up here. So yeah. yeah. So, uh, <laughs> if you come here, I'll show you the best brisket places to go. So all right. <laughs> all right. Yeah. 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 So, we'll so uh, guys, I just want to say like uh, thank you so much for talking with me today. Uh, I, I really enjoyed Road of Bones and your other works too that I've been looking through. Um, Thank you so much, yeah. I, I think, you know, my fans should definitely check out Sea of Sorrows when it comes out in November. And, um, you know, hopefully maybe we can have you guys on again in the future. Yeah, yeah that'd be great. Yeah, this, time, this has been a tough one. So, yeah. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks so much, guys. Yeah.